Good morning and welcome. It is great to have you again this morning with us. This is the morning service for Providence United Methodist Church. My name is Aldana Allen. I am delighted to serve as the pastor here. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Zoom recording. Hope that you will be able to celebrate this day with us and worship God and just know that you are deeply loved. Whenever we open back up, we'd love to have you for an actual visit to be able to come by. We're located at 6450 Bringle Ferry Road, and we look forward to a time of being able to rejoice together in God's house. Until that time, we hope that this virtual service will, uh, will be a blessing to you. I'm starting the recording. Service will begin in about four minutes if you'd like to fast forward. You look fantastic. It's just a different cover for that microphone. How are you going to film it live?
preservation of style is really about appreciating and celebrating these old world things in the new world. Good morning and God bless you. Good morning. Am I audible? Can you hear me this morning? Good morning and God bless you, dear friends. Good morning. It's great to have you in God's house again one, one more time. Thank you for being a part of our morning celebration. Welcome to those of you who are watching by Facebook Live or those of you who are watching the Zoom recording later on. This is the worship service of Providence United Methodist Church, and we are so delighted to have this virtual opportunity with you. We wish we had an opportunity to welcome you into the building and to share our love that way, but hopefully you will be blessed by our virtual experience as well. Again, it's just a beautiful day that the Lord has made, and we're just glad to be able to celebrate this time with you. I'm going to go ahead and invite Tasha to come on up and uh, open us up with a song this morning. In the dark of the midnight, have I altered my face? My soul's held above me. There's no hiding place. It's the crash of the thunder. Precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over. Till the thunder sounds the glory, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand. 
there's no need to try. For there's no end of sorrow, and there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'm not always with the storm. Never gone again. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you. And friends, I'm delighted this morning to have another person participating in our worship service. As I have been calling around and checking on folks and seeing how people have been doing, uh, I have also asked a few of you if you'd be willing to share some of your experiences over the last few months, whether they were uh, some points of, of difficulty or points of joy, just really giving an opportunity to share your testimony. And this morning, Debbie Lambert has uh, expressed an, an interest in being able to do so. She bravely stepped up to my, uh, to my request. And so I want you to welcome her this morning as she comes just to lift up a witness and hopefully a word of encouragement for all of you. Welcome Debbie Lambert this morning, please. not a very good speaker, but I just want to let y'all know I'm, I'm doing it started in November like a late month because I lost 110 pounds, which is good. But then the beginning of the year, it started to be a struggle. I had kidney stones. I had to have them removed. I found out I was sick with them on this side, and I was ready to, ready to give up on the Lord. But he sent me in, and he told me that everything was going to be okay, and I survived that. After that, I had two more surgeries. I just want you to know that God is still there and he's taking care of us through all these rough times that we're having. So just hang in there and he will take care of you. Morning, church family. <clears throat> the peace of Christ be with you. And I wish we could all share the peace together, but we got to have a little social distancing. So I'm going to ask you to do something with me, and this steps on my toes as well as everybody else's. Today, Sunday, sometime, pick up the phone and call someone in your church family that you didn't see today. If you are more comfortable using the uh, Facebook or something, make it a point today at some point to reach out to another church member and share God's love with them. In the book of Acts, it talked about the early believers. It said that they were one in mind and in heart. And they shared everything that they had. And Debbie did that today. She shared her journey with us, her witness. Let's speak the horn and all and let her know, show her a little love. This is supposed to be the opening prayer, but due to time limitations, we don't get to say our extended prayer. Well, this week I became aware of someone who's troubled, who's lost their way. And I'm sure you know somebody or 
has health issues or problems or troubles. So in my prayer, I'm going to pause. And I want you, wherever you're at, to lift up the name of someone on your heart because they need it. And our most powerful ability is our prayer, our prayer to our God. So when I pause, I want you to say it with your voice, not just think it. God can hear you, but through that act, I think you invoke the power of prayer for that person. You go in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, you gave us today, the Sabbath, to come together and worship you, to push back our troubles, to push back what goes on during the week. But Lord, there's there's heaviness on my heart and I need to lift up someone. That's someone who's struggling. You know who they are. There's others here whose heart is hurting for someone. So at this time, we'll lift those names up to you. Wherever we're at, I'll pause. You say the name of the person in your heart. And now, Lord, we know that we can rest knowing that you have them in your care and you'll provide what they need. And now, Lord, let us put our hearts and minds at peace and focus on you and celebrate the awesome God of the universe that we serve. For we are church people. We are your church. And we do not stand and we at what's happening in the world because we know it's a time. It is Sunday. We're celebrating and we're worshiping. Be with us and may our service bring praise, honor, and glory to the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship.
And I'll do this little thing for you And I'll give you so much more Midnight was out on the water And I on the rage to see I spoke to the wind It hushed and I gave you peace Didn't I run to your rescue? Didn't I hear you when you fall? I walked right beside you just so you wouldn't fall. Didn't I leave all of heaven just to die for your sin? I searched until I found you. And I do it all again. Didn't I fall with heaven just to die for your sin? I searched until I found you, and I do it all again. Do it all again. Amen and amen again. Hallelujah. Friends, I'm excited to bring the word again for you this morning. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 10 through 17 to set up the context, but our focus is going to be on verse 18. So it's going to be chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, and I'll read 10 through 17, and then our focus is on verse 18 about about the cross. We're going to be talking about the cross this morning. Before I read, though, let me again say a word of thanks to Debbie Lambert. She did a marvelous job. She indicated that she was a little nervous and concerned, and, and I hope that I kept just trying to tell her, as I tell you all, listen, it's just a matter of you expressing what's on your heart. You don't have to do a 20-minute message like I do. You just come up, and you can just share your testimony, and I hope that encourages you all as well to not only see God's hand on her life, as she has been able to go through the things that she has and to realize that God is with you too, but also to encourage you to be able to speak, that you have a word, that you have a testimony that somebody else needs to hear. I hope we'll be able to keep this up over the weeks and months to come and more people will feel comfortable just getting up and saying, hey, you know what? I was struggling at this point or here's how God came through for me. We'll need to continue that. Amen. Come on. Can I get an amen on that? Somebody come on. Amen. Thank you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, the NRSV puts it this way. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and of the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are some quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Christmas and Gaius, so that none of you can say that you were baptized in my name. And then he adds a parenthetical note. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might be emptied of its power. And our first focus verse, verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. One more time, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, 
the very emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world, a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The hymn writer continues on and uses another beautiful turn of phrase. The, the hymn writer uses another beautiful expression that I'm going to use as my sermon title this morning. And I'm going to talk about the wondrous attraction of the cross. The, the wondrous attraction of the cross. You know, dear friends, every Sunday morning that I get before you, I am charged with the task of bringing forth God's word. And as you might imagine, there are any number of topics that need to be preached. There are any number of things that need to be lifted up and said. And so as I pray throughout the week and as I seek God's listening, guidance and as I try to listen and, and hear where we are supposed to go with the text, I'm reminded of some of the things that we have been listening to and preaching on already this year. Remember, we started right before the lockdown, and we were engaged in a series about the names of God, and we were using these names to help us to understand some more about the characteristics of who God is, and we understood God as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, and Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Debbie can testify to a God who heals this morning. And Jehovah Tekenu, the God of righteousness, we were, we were on that path. And then when the lockdown hit, we needed to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about what it meant for us to trust God in the midst of difficult circumstances and trust God during times of uncertainty and what it meant to, to not worry about tomorrow as Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that there's plenty enough to deal with today, but to trust and to trust and to trust. And then, of course, with the, with the social unrest and the other things that we saw unfolding in our nation, I felt it upon my heart to talk, yes, about racial reconciliation, about healing between sisters and brothers across barriers and across ethnic lines and all the importance of that. But beside all of those very important topics, topics of love and topics of forgiveness and all the incredible things that must be preached and must be taught, I do not want to forget to teach and preach about the cross. Paul makes it a point that he says the cross needs to be lifted up before people. The cross needs to be kept before us because there are some incredible things that happen with the cross. The cross has a wondrous attraction for me. I'm going to lift up for you three things that the cross reminds me about today. Just three things that will be done. But let me give you the context into this 1 Corinthians passage. Make sure we're all on board with what's taking place. 1 Corinthians is one of the letters that Paul writes as he has gone on his missionary journey. He has gone through Asia Minor, and as he has gone through, he has been planting churches all up and down the region. He plants a church in a town in a place called Corinth. But then word gets back to him that the church at Corinth is having all kinds of issues. They've got some wild stuff going on, things that you wouldn't believe that a church would do. They had things like church members suing one another. They had things like people getting drunk off of the communion wine, just all kinds of crazy, wild things that the church at Corinth was doing. And so Paul writes them, not once, but twice, Paul writes them two letters to help them get their act together so that they can know what it means to be believers and walk in Christ. And so here we see the opening of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And he says, now word has gotten to me that there are some divisions among you. That some people are siding with this group and some people are siding with this group. And, and we're breaking apart over foolish things. And we're not keeping our minds united and our purpose centralized. So Paul writes them because he has to point out to them the error of their ways. And then he, he reinforces this by saying, now, if we were to really get our minds back on the same thing, we need to remember the wondrous attraction of the cross. He says in verse 18 that the cross is foolishness 
The cross is foolishness to, to those who are perishing. The outside world doesn't understand. The Greek word that is used there is the same root word for the word moron. He says that the outside world, we look like morons for gathering here Sunday morning after Sunday morning. Why are we wasting our weekend like this, gathering in this space? To the outside world, we look like morons praying to a God we've never seen. We, to the outside world, we look like morons giving up a portion of our income and tithing. He says across, the understanding of, of the relationship to God is foolishness to everyone else. Ah. But to those who have experienced his love, to those who have felt his touch, to those who have, who have come in contact with the Lord, the cross is our salvation. Listen as I lift up these three thoughts for you this morning. Three things why the cross has a wondrous attraction. Number one, for me, the cross is a reminder of the punishment I deserve. You can write that down. I know you're in your cars, or if you want to write that down or, or, or say it to yourself so you have a way of remembering it. The, the wondrous attraction of the cross is a reminder of the punishment I deserve. Listen, when I think about Jesus, the one who actually hung on the cross, I am, I am reminded that he didn't do anything to deserve to get there. The history and the record of Jesus is a story of love after love after love. The history and the story of Jesus is one who went throughout the region healing people of their afflictions, going through and open blinding eye, blinded eyes, going through and unstopping deaf ears, going through and providing love and hope and encouragement to people. That's the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus, as Tasha just sang, is the one who is even able to speak to the wind and has power to calm the chaos and the storms that people were experiencing. That's the story of Jesus. But when I compare the one who was only the cross, when I compare the story of Jesus with the story of Aldana, woo, I'm reminded I was the one who was supposed to be on that cross. The wondrous attraction of the cross is a reminder of the punishment that I deserve. When I think about the history and the story of Aldana, I'm reminded that I have lied. When I think about the history and the story of Aldana, I remind, I'm reminded that I have coveted. When I think about the history and the story of Aldana, I am reminded that I have lusted. When I think about the history and the story, oh no, that's enough. That's enough. Y'all get out of my business. You don't need to know everything now. It's between me and the Lord. <laughs> but I imagine that you have a list like I have a list. I imagine that there might be some overlap on our list and there may be a few things that you have done that I haven't or I have done that you haven't. There may be a word or two that you said that you wish you could take back. There might be an action or two that you have done that you wish you could take back and you know within your heart of hearts that the words that we hear in Romans 3, 23 is true, that all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Yeah. The reason why the cross is a wondrous attraction, this emblem of suffering and shame, it holds a wondrous attraction because it's a reminder of the punishment that I deserve. Here's the second thing you can write this down. The wondrous attraction of the cross is a reminder of the promise that has been fulfilled. The promise that has been fulfilled. See, when I look at that cross and I realize it should have been me, but instead Jesus went, I'm also then reminded that this was God's plan all along. That God looked at the condition of the world and God knew that we as human beings could never be good enough to get back to God. That we would never get it completely right. Try though we may, try though we should, try though we should, we never can quite be perfect. We might be perfect in, in, in heart and in thought, in, in, our, in our want, in our desire of God, but somewhere along the lines, we still find ourselves in a place of sin. And so I'm reminded that the cross tells me that God fulfilled his promise. 
But God said, Aldana, I know you can't get to me. I know you don't have it within you to work your way to be good enough to, to stay consistent on the course long enough to get back to me. So I'm going to devise a path. I'm going to devise a plan where I can get back to you. God's righteousness, God take Kenu, has to be solved. His righteousness has to be accounted for. But his love is also so there and so preeminent. And so he looks at Sandy and he, he looks at Dylan and he says, I want you back in the fold. And I want you back in the family. And I don't want you left out. So as a result, he says, I'll devise a plan. I'll devise a plan and I'll make it real simple. You want to know how simple it is? Here it is. Just believe. But, but don't I have to grovel on the ground? Don't I have to protest and show how wretched I am? No. The Bible says, believe. Believe that he who was sent was the one who was the redemption for the entire world. Believe. The cross holds a wondrous attraction for me. It reminds me of the punishment that I deserve. It reminds me of the promise that has been fulfilled, and listen, it reminds me of a power that has been provided. I love that. It reminds me of a power that has been provided. Let me quote from Reverend John Dobbs. He says, keeping the cross of Christ in the center of our lives is key to staying centered in these turbulent times. The problem is that we place so many other things in the center of our lives, and it works against us. We have to be careful to not let other things find their way into the center of our lives. Otherwise, people might have too much influence over our lives. Otherwise, we might easily put a person or something else on a pedestal. We can even do this with our church. We can do this with our religious leaders or our political leaders. We can do this with ourselves, our habits, our old habits, our dealings with our inward struggles. Anything that becomes more important is wrong. But we keep instead the focus on the cross, the wondrous attraction, the, the wondrous attraction that causes me to stop and look at this emblem of suffering and shame isn't because I want to see the grotesqueness of it. You know how you're driving down a road and, and, the, and there's an accident and the rubberneckers all keep looking over to the side because we're interested in, in what has happened. I don't think any of us want to see the grotesqueness of an accident, but we are interested in what has happened. And, and so as our interest is there, so I think about with the cross. The wondrous attraction of the cross is indeed a reminder of the punishment that should have been mine. It's a reminder of the promise that has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And it's a reminder of the power that I have right now in my everyday life. Right now, I have the power we as believers have been made righteous and become the sons and the daughters of God. Not only that, but we have become joint heirs with Christ. And so as the hymn writer says, I am looking forward to a time when I can lay down that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. We should be aware of the cross and keep it ever before us. I also add these final words, dear friends. As I think about the love and the incredibleness of what Jesus has done, the power of the cross means a hope in a resurrection. You see, he went up on that cross, and he sure died in my place, and he sure did fulfill a promise, and he sure did lift up power. But when he died on that cross and went into the grave, the good news is he didn't stay there. He went up on that cross and he died. He shed his blood, but he came down off that cross, went into the grave, and then came back out of the grave. And that, dear friends, is the ultimate power that we will all tap into one day. That this life will come to an end, that we will give up this mortal coil. But all of us, every one of us who have trusted and believed, every one of us is an inheritance of the promise and a belief that says that we will live again. That death does not have the final say. This is gospel good news. No matter how far you've fallen, no matter how much you've done, no matter how cantankerous you've been. Remember, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and all of the craziness and all of the divisions and everything that was going on in that church. And he speaks to them and he says, no, focus back 
on the cross, remember what was done for you. And remember to walk in that power and in that victory today. The wondrous attraction of the cross. Amen. Amen. Again, dear friends, thank you for being a part of our morning service. Thank you for those of you who are watching this recording later online. We'll share now just a word of benediction and praying that God's strength and power will be with you this day. Let's be dismissed together. Most holy and gracious Father, again, we give you thanks for this beautiful morning. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you, Almighty God, for reminding us that though there is so much we need to hear from the Bible, we also need to be reminded of the importance and the necessity of the cross. Thank you for what you did on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for bridging the gap back to you for us. We ask now, Almighty Father, that you would help us as we depart from this place. Send your angels to watch over us. Give us your protection and your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen.